On Health Matters Television for Life, a high school football player is airlifted to the hospital after a hit on the field knocks him out. It could have been so much worse. Go inside the newest chopper at Northwest MedStar and see how technology is saving lives. It's been a very exciting time in the development of emergency medicine. From urgent care to the ER, experience the fast-paced world of modern emergency medicine right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSBS, and by the following. I really liked the idea of being part of Providence, where if I have a question, if there's something that I'm concerned about, I can always call a specialist. I'm Dr. Anna Barber, and I chose Providence because here I can help children thrive and reach their highest potential. If you read Providence's mission statement, it's all about delivering quality care to the patient at all times. I'm Dr. Peter Rinaldi, and I chose Providence because they put the doctor-patient relationship first. Find your doctor online at phc.org. Good evening, and welcome to Health Matters. I'm your host, Teresa Lukens. According to the CDC, emergency departments across the country see more than 136 people every year. It's a uh, specialized, uh, certainly in emergency medicine, and it's one that a lot of people are fascinated by. Also, urgent care is another specialty, and we're gonna break down both of those today with our group of panelists who we've assembled tonight to talk about emergency care and urgent care, and also um, EMTs. So with us tonight is Heather Healy. She is the director of nursing and the director of six urgent care clinics for Rockwood Health Systems. Dan Getz is the Medical Director for Providence Sacred Heart Emergency Department. Sean Pitts is an Advanced Emergency Medical Technician and Instructor for Inland Northwest Health Services. And Tamara Brining works in the Emergency Department at Valley Hospital where she is one of the Assistant Medical Directors. And thank you all for being here tonight. This is a great topic and one we really haven't uh, explored. And it's very specialized, it's very different, I think fascinating to a lot of people and often uh, one that they don't know about until they have to use one of your services. So let's talk first about emergency care, Dan, and um, what we're talking about when we're talking about the emergency room and the unique features to the emergency room and why we go there and, and what is offered. Sure. Uh, emergency medicine is a fairly unique specialty in that we're really the first line of care for life-threatening or potentially immediately disabling illness. So if you see that ambulance is driving by, usually they're coming to see one of our local ERs with pretty sick people. And uh, there's a lot of confusion on what warrants an ED visit, but anything that's potentially life-threatening or disabling, we tend to take care of. Um, but kind of get all comers from people that break ankles to having chest pain to having stroke symptoms, abdominal pain. Um, we get a fair number of referrals from urgent cares as well where they have a person who presents with a complaint that may not be appropriate for their setting, but they'll send up to see us in the emergency department. Well, and that's a great way to bring you in, Heather, and to talk about more about the urgent care facilities. We're seeing a lot of them now in Spokane, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. So why do we go to urgent care as opposed to maybe going to the emergency room? It's a, it's a great access point um, during the week, during the day, if you can't get in with your primary care um, and you have cold, uh, flu-like symptoms, um, chest colds, this flu bug that's going around right now. Um, it's, so it's not the urgent, immediate, um, really life altering that Dan was talking about. Some of the quick um, illnesses in the urgent care, we can do you know ankles and, and uh, um, sprains and strains, uh, that type of thing. But it's uh, some very quick colds, flus, um, and, uh, and then we just kind of assess. And if we do feel like maybe you needed an ER, then we absolutely send um, to, to the ERs um, in the area. Um, Rockwood Valley and then uh, Providence is needed. And the idea being that I can just walk in and get that care that right. I need if my physician isn't available. You're probably fairly busy on weekends then also. Right, we have our weekend hours um, and Saturdays and Sundays, those are times when people can't get into primary care and so they, but they're sick, they need to get in, they wanna get healthier, get them back to work. Um, and so Saturdays and Sundays are busy, um, especially with all of the sports going on. We'll get uh, kiddos there, we have sports physicals, so we can take care of that. So some wellness things too, um, so that's good. Mm -hmm. And Sean, uh, your crews are first on the scene as EMTs and so you're there to do that first assessment to get them to one of the facilities. Uh, talk about your role and, and the uh, larger role that EMTs play. 
Um, absolutely. So we, uh, you know, you call 911 and we're, we're who shows up to your house. Um, a mix of EMTs or possibly in some areas advanced EMTs and other areas offer paramedicine, um, more of an advanced life support. Um, most all of our patients we are taking from their home to a uh, emergency department facility. Um, every once in a while we get uh, a, someone out of an urgent care facility that we're taking into the emergency department, uh, whether it was something that was a little more critical than the patient thought or the nursing staff there decided that it would need to be handled more on the, the ED side of things. And so we transport them in and uh, get them taken care of by the nif different uh, ER facilities here in Spokane. And Tamar, emergency facilities are becoming actually a little more specialized, catering some catering to seniors. We have Children's Hospital, of course, with a, a trauma unit. So talk about how we're addressing those unique needs uh, of the patients and not just kind of a cattle call, so to speak. Yeah, that's true. We've kind of, each different, um, each different institution that we have in Spokane has a certain you know, level of specialty, whether it be the Sacred Heart Children's Hospital. We focus uh, more on some geriatric approach from Valley Hospital standpoint, being a geriatric friendly ED. Um, well, urgent care as well, I call, you know, you see all walks, of course, you have young, old, doesn't, you know, all age ranges, but um, there are some specialty EDs as well, even outside of our local community as well, that focus on subspecialty neurology, et cetera, that kind of thing. But I think we're probably all the emergency departments in our surrounding area, Spokane specifically, uh, can tailor to, you know, to any, anyone who walks through the door or gets brought in through the ambulance door. So to kind of take us through that process, especially mm -hmm. where you cater to seniors, why is it unique for them? So um, for seniors specifically, uh, one of the focuses that we took was being able to have a comfortable, easy access, accessible environment. So essentially that's easier parking. So bringing a parking spot closer to the door because it's a big deal to get from that car to the front door in some cases. Um, we have thicker mattress uh, for the stretchers. So essentially we've added more padding. So you don't, feel, you don't feel the stretcher as much while you're sitting there getting your care. So little things that make the difference. And Dan, we often say on this show um, with a lot of our docs that um, the children aren't just small adults. They have special needs, and that's mm -hmm. where Children's uh, Hospital, Sacred Heart Children's Hospital, comes into play with the only area uh, trauma unit for kids. Yeah, it's, with the way we have set up our pediatric emergency department is it's, for the most part, staffed by uh, emergency medicine physicians fellowship trained in pediatric care. It's definitely a very different specialty from general emergency medicine and, and very unique practice, and they do a very good job providing care to very, very sick children. That's uh, one of the challenges when you have a children's hospital is you deal with the uh, pediatric population with some very serious illnesses and we have children come even from the Seattle area to, to receive care in Spokane. Mm -hmm. So um, all of the equipment is geared toward children, it's child size so to oh, speak? Oh yeah, I mean even the way you walk in the waiting room there's a tremendously big fish tank and there's video games and it's we try to make it as comfortable as we can for the, the children as well as the family. It's an entirely different waiting room from our adult waiting room mm -hmm. uh, and they just Thanks to a, a large donation from Mark Rippon, built the new pediatric emergency department. It's absolutely beautiful uh, and very comfortable for children as well as their families. So, Sean, is that an automatic uh, for EMTs then to, to know which um, facility to use? I'm, I'm fascinated by that process. Yeah, How absolutely. Does that work? We, we all have uh, policies and procedures that uh, we determine on scene if it's a pediatric patient, then we'll be headed down to see uh, people down at Sacred Heart. Um, different uh, levels of care, whether it's a cardiac patient and what hospital they're supposed to go to, or if it's a stroke patient, utilizing those. And so Spokane County and other agencies like them have uh, protocols set up that we can use as guidelines of where to go. And one thing that we've always utilized is what's called like an online medical direction where we can pick up our cell phones or our radios and contact an ER physician and say, you know, these are our patient's symptoms. Would you like to be, them to be seen at your facility or would you prefer them to go to a more specialized facility? Um, which kind of allows us to make that choice for our patients if they're critical enough where they're not going to be choosing where they're going. Most of the time, most of our patients, one of our first questions is what hospital would you like to be seen at? And those patients determine where they're going to go. And we, we try to follow those wishes until there's something specialized that's absolutely needed. When someone picks up the phone to call 911 and they need assistance, when does an ambulance arrive and when does a fire aid car arrive? How is that determined? So in, in this area, if you call 911 and you're requesting uh, any sort of medical need, um, the fire department around here uh, is staffed with EMTs and paramedics. And so you will get a fire 
uh, response, whether it's an engine or something along those lines, uh, and then an ambulance response. And so most places, uh, especially in the city of Spokane and the Spokane County area, you get both a fire department and an ambulance company. Uh, we're all pretty used to working uh, together. Um, and again, just depends on where you live, whether the fire department has a paramedic or it's just a paramedic on an ambulance. Um, but that advanced life support, that paramedic level is definitely, uh, we strive to get, or, get to our community um, as quick as possible because of their scope of practice. Mm -hmm. And Heather, more people are using urgent care, which is a good thing. And with the health insurance changes, you're seeing more patients at your clinics. What, what would you like those people to know that maybe haven't set foot in an urgent care facility before they arrive? What do they need to know, um, for instance, about their insurance or what they need to bring and the type of, of doctor and nurses that they're going to see? Um, so in our urgent cares, uh, we're staffed by uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, so they could see all three of the provider type. Um, we have uh, RNs um, and medical assistants, so they see the whole the whole gamut. Um, one really, really, really important thing is their medication list, mm. um, because if they've come to urgent care for the very first time, either they are uh, Rockwood patients or they're Providence patients or they're just um, moving through because they're visiting family for a function or whatever, we don't have any of their health records on file. And so we need to know what medications they're taking so that we can treat them properly, prevent um, more illness because we had meds that didn't match or allergies. Um, so if they had a med list, if they had um, a list of some of their chronic conditions, that's helpful um, so that we can kind of narrow it down and, and speed up their care. Because mm -hmm. we'd like to get them in and out quickly. Well, I can see how that would be a challenge because mm -hmm. essentially you're seeing this doctor probably for the first time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if I've been to an urgent care do, and I need to go back at some point, is it important to go to the same one? So um, in our six system, they're all connected. Um, and so it helps with the, the connection with the computer systems um, and the medical record. So if you went to one Rockwood um, in our Argonne facility or a Rockwood at Liberty Lake, those medical records will be connected. So it doesn't matter which urgent care you go to, we would have that data. I, I'm hearing a lot about customer service and the fact that there's a, you know, a, lot, being, a lot of thought being put, put into making sure the patient is comfortable, making sure that you see them quickly. And in fact, you actually have a 30 minute or less policy. We have a pledge. Talk about that. Yeah. So essentially, we pledge to see the patient within 30 minutes upon arrival in the department. Now, when you first come in, you're greeted by a greeter, obviously. If you need something emergently, it happens emergently. Um, but as a provider, we actually staff physician assistants and nurse practitioners in the front of the emergency department such that we can get a look at them sooner within that 30 minute time frame to decide what do we need to do, like Heather was saying, to expedite the care and figure out what we need to do for their stay at the emergency department and figure out the best way to get them through and get them what they need. So it kind of helps us to expedite their care overall. So save some time. Typically, how many staff are, are on and is there a, a busy time? I mean, do you have more people at n overnight or on weekends or say in the summer months when we tend to see more injuries? Yeah, summer are our busiest months with trauma seasons. With the way Spokane has grown, uh, there's really no slow time in the emergency mm -hmm. department. Uh, we finished last year seeing 82,000 patients. Mm -hmm in the emergency department Sacred Heart and we're on pace to see close to 100,000 this year. So it, it really, you really build from probably 2 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, and then it slows down a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very busy the whole time. We have a similar approach where we use advanced practice providers, both nurse practitioners and uh, physician assistants in triage. We call it a provider and triage program to try and get patients seen more expediently on our very high volume days, which tend to be Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And we're going to actually expand that probably to every day in the week just because we're running out of real estate when we're dealing with this patient volumes. But the customer satisfaction, and, and that's what patients are, our customers, is really coming to the forefront of emergency medicine and actually in 2016 or early 2017, they're going to be rolling about ED caps, which is hospitals are going to be reimbursed, part of their Medicare DRG money based on patient satisfaction surveys. So it's really one of those things where it used to be you come into an emergency department, who knows how your experience was, you're going to get a tremendously large bill and thanks, have a nice day. Well, now patients have a chance to contribute back and if they've had a bad experience, we need to know about it. What are some of the challenges that you're facing? 
Well, I think expectations, and this is, I think, a huge question in the minds of people when they come in the emergency department. I almost wish we could rename it the what it ain't department, yeah. because I'll get mm -hmm. a patient that comes in, and they'll be in the emergency department for three and a half hours, and I'll order a battery of tests, and they'll come in with abdominal pain, and at the end of three hours, I'll sit down, and I'll tell them I don't know what the cause of their abdominal pain is, but I can tell them what it's not. It's not a life-threatening issue like an aortic aneurysm or appendicitis or a gallbladder. And it's frustrating for people to have no answer, but I always tell them that no news is good news from the emergency department. So if we can sell them some reassurance and realize that you don't have a life-threatening or potentially disabling condition and you're stable to follow up with your primary care physician for further testing, that's, that's the value of the emergency department. Mm -hmm. But if we do find something, we're equipped to handle that. But we're set to look for a very small spectrum of illness that could potentially kill you. And if we don't find that, that's, that's a good thing for people. Mm -hmm. Is that some of the challenges in a way that you face also with urgent care? We do that. I think people will see a health system name and then they'll, they'll go there no matter what. And so we'll have people come into the urgent care um, that have had, you know, the classic um, chest pain signs, you know, pressure radiating up my jaw, down my arm, and um, it, they just see Rockwood or um, they see Providence and that's where they go. Um, and that's really not the best care for them because we can't get to the those are the ones that might cause a death, so we need to get them to the ER as fast as we can. So then we call our EMS team and they get them there quick. Um, but yes, it is difficult for patients to kind of figure out they're scared in an emergency mm -hmm. and um, all that they know is I go to Rockwood or I go to Providence and I wanna see my doc, but I can't, so I'm gonna go to the next best thing. And so they just see the name and they go right in. So we have highly trained staff that can triage that patient and figure out, is this the right place or is the ER the right place? Um, and sometimes ERs will do the reverse and then they'll figure out like you're a level five or a level one and then they help to triage um, and get the, the right care for the right thing. And that's what's frustrating, I think, for patients, too. When they walk into a busy waiting room, they see 20 patients, right. and they keep saying people coming past them into the emergency department, they get frustrated. I've been here two hours, mm -hmm. and that patient just walked in. But what she alluded to was the triage criteria. If someone presents with a potentially more serious complaint, we expedite them back as quickly as possible. And I don't think people always realize that the ambulance is coming through the back door as well at a steady clip. And mm -hmm. I think we see, last, last I saw to statistically, about 80% of all ambulance traffic goes to Sacred Heart. So we have a steady stream of ambulances, sometimes 60 ambulances a day. They're coming through the back door, which also makes it harder for people to get through the front door. I think that's why it's essential that we now have the providers in the kind of the front of the department mm -hmm. as well because, you know, when you're looking at prime real estate for sick, sick patients, if you can see someone quickly that doesn't require a bed, that can stay upright and get their treatment quickly, then I think that's worth, worth its weight in gold because then, you know, they don't have to stay for a prolonged, you know, workup and the patient that needs the bed can get to the bed faster and get what they need. So I think that's a big, I think that's a big drive um, right. with w some of the programs that we've instituted both of our, at both of our EDs. It's yeah, so all about in process waiting now, it's the name of the mm -hmm. game. So when you walk through our front door, and I hate calling it a waiting room, when you walk into our lobby, even if we can't get a bed back before you, if we can get in front of a provider and start care, get your work up going so that that maybe potentially hour and a half that you waited is actually an hour and a half to getting you dispositioned home, that's where the value add is, is for the patient. Definitely. We actually have a caller coming in from Spokane, Kathy. Good evening, Kathy. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for calling. Do you have a question for our panel? Yes, I just want to know, like, um, when you go, I recently went to an urgent care and because um, I had fallen, and um, there is a doctor that, you know, talked to me, and I got x-rays and stuff. And then there is a different doctor that um, um, read the x-rays. So I wanted to know, and that doctor was not a provider in my insurance. So I wanted to know, like, as a patient coming in, what questions do we have to ask? Do we have to ask, like, if the, if the doctor that's going to be seeing us is in our network and the doctor that reads the x-rays, is that a different network? Um, does this make sense? Yes, I think it does, Kathy. And uh, Heather, can you take that? Yeah, so I think it's an excellent question. And, and one of the uh, th topics we haven't really touched on is how insurance dictates where you go. Um, to what urgent care you go to, what emergency room you go to. Um, and in terms of the radiologist, um, so 
we, for in the Rockwood urgent care system, um, we do take the um, radiological films, um, and then a radiologist does the confirmation film, which would be the same um, in the emergency rooms. Um, and that radiologist um, is partnered um, with Rockwood. And so if the insurance work for Rockwood, you know, we're not, we don't 100% always know that the radiologist is gonna be the insurance carrier. So we do check on the insurance for the emergency room visit or the urgent care visit, but some of the ancillary services, um, it's not always 100% uh, that we know all of your parts and pieces to the insurance. And I think what's really challenging is there's so many um, divisions with the different insurance companies. And so they will, they'll cover this or they'll pay for this, but they won't pay for that. And that's insurance A. Insurance B is going to do it a little bit different. Insurance C does it a little bit different. Um, and so on our end, that is hard sometimes for our reception staff and um, for our medical staff. So what we do is our primary objective is we wanna get you in, we wanna get you taken care of, and we wanna get the medications and, and things that you need. Um, and then, then that other financial part is that back end. So for the caller's question, um, it's great to look through your, um, your benefit package and figure it out which hospital um, do they want you to go to, which emergency room do they want you to go to, which urgent care do they want you to go to, and then do they really place it out specifically on which lab, which uh, radiology, and that can help. Um, but that's data that the patient needs to come in with us or with them for us. Again, good information to have along yeah. with that medication list. These are you know, things that you should be preparing for before you have the emergency or before you become Absolutely. sick. Absolutely, yeah. And make it's sure great that you to have, have in your wallet or in your purse. That's great. Mm -hmm. I wanna bring in a, another piece of the puzzle when it comes to emergency care. As we've seen, Spokane's emergency rooms and urgent care centers are ready at a moment's notice to provide life-saving medical assistance. And one key to that success is Northwest MedStar, which uses helicopters to transport patients. With a service area that reaches into four states, Northwest MedStar covers a lot of ground and transports a lot of patients. Hundreds every year. But Dr. James Nania, medical director for MedStar, is quick to point out, it's not about the numbers, it's about the people. You just have to meet one person that wouldn't, wasn't gonna be there next Christmas, wasn't gonna make their birthday, wasn't gonna see their first kid born, and see that they are alive by virtue of what is done here. And that's why I'm a total fan. It is miracles. Those miracles happen high in the sky at speeds of 140 miles an hour and in some pretty tight quarters. Here, EMS personnel have access to tools once reserved for hospital staff. The monitors are much more sophisticated. Only maybe 20 years ago, you could not do an EKG to look for a heart attack until they got to the hospital. The added technology and training mean that Dr. Nania's team can not only treat, but prevent some common killers. We're able now to stop strokes sometimes. We're able to stop heart attacks sometimes. It's that combination of speed and expertise that gives patients a fighting chance. Patients like Maxwell Milkey. I was playing in a football game at Lakeside High School and I was running the football and I ended up getting helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact and ended up going in and out of consciousness and ended up having a fracture to the skull and bleeding of the brain. Maxwell was airlifted by Northwest MedStar. The medical treatment he received in route and at the hospital made all the difference. It could have been so much worse. Thanks to them, I pretty much am a normal human being. MedStar operates from six sites in eastern Washington and Montana, ready to go 24-7. An investment in critical care that is paying off one call at a time. It's the best. And Dan, talk about this MedStar unit. These are incredible flying <clears throat> mini hospitals, in essence. Yeah, they're amazing. They're, they're flying ICUs and the, the staff that work on them are incredible. Um, they're taking patients from the middle of nowhere out in the highways and scooping them up and, and protecting their airway and guarding their cervical spine and, and stabilizing them in route so that we can get them into a hospital setting and really start working on them. It's, it's, it's amazing technology and it's really something that's advanced the practice of emergency medicine just over the past 20 years. And uh, historically, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you'd go to a critical access hospital that may not have been equipped to deal with the level of injuries that you have. Now we can get you from almost anywhere within 20 to 50 minutes to a trauma center. 
uh, and from a trauma surgeon and emergency medicine specialist. It's pretty amazing. When we live in, in an area where we, you know, you're 20 minutes from being in a rural area, we have lots of small towns, mm -hmm. and, and now they also even offer that yearly uh, payment service, which um, we've seen a lot of people end up using. Otherwise, that can be a pretty expensive ride to the hospital. Can be. Yeah, absolutely, but well worth it also. Um, talk about the technology that's inside uh, MedStar. Sure. Well, the, the mobile ICU units, whether they're going by air or by ground, have pretty much everything you would in an ICU. They have advanced um, pumps and things to deliver life-saving medications if they need it. They have uh, advanced airway supplies if they need to intubate you or, or protect your airway. They have pretty much everything that you'd have in the ICU. Um, very nice uh, amount of medications. Should your heart have some issues, they have a, a nice library that they can pick through. Are these physicians on board? For the most part, no. Usually they're um, uh, RNs, former ICU RNs, that are trained specifically in how to deliver care in, in uh, the environment for transport. There are some places where they'll have physicians on EMS teams, but I don't believe that Spokane is using that. So pretty, pretty amazing that we have that here at our disposal. Again, oh, yeah, it just kind of goes to what Spokane has to offer. Um, in medicine, and again, taking you inside the, the emergency room and urgent care facilities here on Health Matters tonight. Um, Sean, let's talk about uh, CPR. Um, there was just a story out of Everett, I believe it was last week, where two teenage girls had just completed their CPR class at high school. They were at a restaurant, and a gentleman was having a, an incident, and those two girls who had just completed that CPR class pulled him out of his pickup and performed CPR and most likely saved his life. Um, Pretty amazing stuff. But a lot of people are still hesitant to learn CPR or to use it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we're doing around this area is um, working on teaching what's called hands-only CPR, which takes out the mouth-to-mouth -mouth piece, the mouth-to-mask, the is breathing Is that why piece. people were hesitant I, I think that was the biggest problem, is they were concerned about whether it was disease prevention or transfer of diseases or not knowing, maybe not doing it correctly. Um, there's a couple different agencies around here uh, that do do uh, hands-only CPR classes. Um, there's a couple of groups. I know um, one of the doctors from Providence does a group uh, for the high schools and the Meade School District as well as some of the District 81 where the seniors are getting taught uh, CPR, which is pretty impressive. Um, trying to get as many people as possible. We always get the phone calls of, you know, how young can I have my son or daughter learn to do CPR? And we basically just tell people if they're strong enough to push on someone's chest, we can teach them how to do CPR. Um, we don't have to teach the the mouth-to-mouth -mouth piece. We don't have to teach the pulse check piece. Just if the person doesn't look like they have signs of life, then teaching them how to do chest compressions. Uh, one of the big new things that's here in the Spokane area is the Pulse Point app. Uh, it's an app that goes on your phone that notifies uh, you as a public service person. Um, anybody can download it that actually notifies you of a cardiac arrest nearby in a public venue. Wow. Um, and recently here in Spokane, they did have the first uh, confirmed save. The app is actually based out of California. And the first for confirmed save was here in Spokane, Washington. Uh, that individual was, was uh, his story was uh, sent all around the nation. Um, and, and talked about that story, but uh, anybody can download it and it's just getting CPR by bystanders quicker. Uh, one of the biggest things we deal with in the ambulance that we can't control is the amount of time it takes us to get to the rural area. Um, the ambulance company that I work for, best case scenario, you know, inside town, we can be there in 10 to 15 minutes. Worst case scenario, we cover 720 square miles and so it could be 45 minutes to 50 minutes before you get an ambulance. And so getting bystanders there quicker that can do CPR is a pretty important piece. And this hands-only piece is just as effective as the old CPR that some of us learned many years ago? Absolutely. American Heart Association is going to chest compressions is the most important piece of that CPR. Um, your body has some oxygen reserves. It has some oxygen left over in your body. So circulating that to your brain into your heart and some of your vital organs is definitely the most important piece of that. So how young can you be to learn this technique? Um, we've, seen, we've seen kids as young as 11 or 12 that can push down in the chest and we are gladly to teach them CPR and get them out there so that you know, in the unique circumstances they have to use it, they can do it uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing more family members uh, that bring in patients into the emergency room that have performed CPR and, and saved lives? We've had a few, yeah, yeah. it's what saved them. That's pretty exciting. And the, and the, and the hands only? Uh, hands only, because mm -hmm. okay. they weren't actually trained, the few cases that we've had uh, when I was on shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know there used to be a fear that you could hurt somebody with CPR. Well, 
Probably a little bit, but uh, it's for the good of them. For the good. Uh, yeah, you, you got to press them pretty hard. And I think the benefit also of the, the taking these type of classes, they also train you on the use of the automated external defibrillators, which is also a key We're point. We're seeing a lot more of those And also. those definitely save lives. So teaching teaching the public how to utilize those, it's it's making a huge impact on, on people that have witnessed cardiac arrest. And I think the thing for the public to remember, and this might sound crass, but they're dead. Mm. So you can't hurt them. You can only save them. I've never heard it put quite that way, and I think you yeah. make an excellent point. Yeah, so. <laughs> Let's take another phone call. We have uh, Tina from Spokane. Good evening, Tina. Hi, this is Tina, and I just have a couple of questions about emergency services sure. here in Spokane. Sure. Um, I've been an RN for 44 years, and I've worked here at a local ER and also at a local ambulatory care office. And I have concerns about ER accessibility. I had a knee replacement about four years ago, and I had absolute excellent care. The following year, uh, my husband had some uh, issues that required a uh, CAT scan, and they discovered that he had a tumor um, in his pancreas. And he was treated absolutely with excellence at Cancer Care Northwest with the scans and the Whipple procedure. But afterwards, he, he was in the hospital for a, a month. He had major complications. Um, his, his oncologist surgeon called Sacred Heart and said, this, is, I, this guy's coming in. This is what's going on. He needs to be seen, and we literally sat in the ER for five hours. I went up to them and asked, is there a place he can actually lay down? He was propped in a chair with his feet on another chair, barely able to do anything. And <clears throat> having the ER experience in the past, which isn't that updated now, I was very, very frustrated with the way he was treated, the lack of response to getting him in a room and the fact that the oncology physician had called in and said this needs to be dealt with and i just don't feel we were adequately addressed i think we were put off and he was out in the waiting area for a minimum of four to five hours without you know with all that other contagious stuff going on all right, thank you, Tina. Would anyone like to uh, address? It was an, obviously she was very frustrated by that process. Sure, that's it. We hate to have people wait. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of things that, that maybe would have prevented that wait is that oncologists could have always directly admitted this patient to the hospital if he thought he needed to be hospitalized. Maybe didn't need to go to the ER in the first place um, and just had one of the internal medicine physicians upstairs care for him. Um, secondly, we don't keep people out there on purpose. It's if the emergency department's full and we have high acuity, we have to deal with the ill people that we have. Uh, five hours is an extensive wait, and I, I hate to hear numbers like that. That's by no means the norm. Um, and there's no lobby that's a comfortable setting for somebody that's hurting. Um, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate experience, though. When people do go to emergency departments, there's always the potential they're going to be waiting a fair amount of time if they're, not a, if, they're, if they're stable. If they're not acutely decompensating, requiring aggressive care immediately, then we're going to take care of those people ahead of them that do. Mm -hmm. Was there anything she could have maybe done differently in that situation, not knowing the full story? but Yeah, it's, it's really tough, and that's one of the things that we're constantly as an emergency department striving to improve. Um, and what Dan you know, speaks of with regards to communicating well with your physician or your oncologist or someone to kind of advocate on your behalf, it may save you a trip even into the emergency department, not to you know turn business away, but at the same time, to get him the care that he needs um, more expeditiously, it might be sometimes best to have your provider kind of speak on your behalf. Um, but other than that, no, I don't think there's anything he or she could have done differently. It's just the way that the current system works with when you have someone who you're actively resuscitating in the back or an ambulance that you know you brought in somebody that you're resuscitating there and you can't physically get out to see the patient or get them back into a bed i think that's why we're constantly trying to make you know small improvements every day to expedite and kind of prevent that from happening those five-hour waits it's 
That's, and a that's the problem. rationale behind the urgent care is opening. Really, we're trying to drive patients that don't require the level of facility at an emergency department to urgent care. It's more cost effective, you're a better steward of resources, and those people that really do require the advanced care have an easier time getting access to that. Um, it, it is pretty amazing the levels of care we have, starting with uh, the first responders mm -hmm. and then having access now to urgent care and then an uh, emergency room or your own physician. So we really do have those different levels, so to speak, um, that you just need to target and know what's best for your situation or have the doctors assess that and mm -hmm. let you know what's best for that situation. Well, so we are fortunate. Providence is rolling out telemedicine now to the area. So if you have I'd pink have eye case. or if you have a cough, you can take a picture of what's bothering you. And for $35, they'll take care of that via a teleconsult, so you don't even have to leave your own home. And I think what you're going to see now with, with for cost containment, the landscape of, of medicine is really shifting towards more accessible medicine that still is, has good quality but for cheaper. And if we can keep people in their own home, they don't need to get in their car and even drive to an urgent care, that's going to save money for the system and they should still have pretty quality care. Mm -hmm. How much networking is going on between the facilities and, and these different levels of care? Are there are ways that you get together and put your heads together to, to try and, and address those customer issues? I think quite a bit. I know for, um, for us, we, we meet with the, um, the management for um, our emergency rooms in our system um, every quarter. Um, and then we have the physicians that communicate back and forth. Um, we actually uh, just met with um, some of the community boards that had INHS with it um, for some regional disaster planning and wanting to make sure we didn't look at just the emergency room for disaster planning, but we looked at the urgent cares as well. Um, so we're starting to do a lot more community awareness, community benefit, community um, relationships to make sure that we're meeting the need um, of, the, of the area. Um, so I, no, being new in town, I feel like we're doing quite a bit to to start to build those relationships and, and uh, communicate with all of the different entities because it start it can start in an urgent or it starts with EMS and then they go to the the ER or it starts with urgent care and then we need EMS to get them to the ER. So oh, the we pieces can't, have to fit together. Exactly, we can't do it alone and we can't kind of do it in a silo. We we for the best patient care and to make the the time smaller for like the caller who had that long wait. We're trying to to really streamline it and like Dan said, have the patients go to the right level of care um, to get it in faster. Mm -hmm. And also be prepared if we were to have some sort of large scale disaster. I know there's a lot of readiness uh, drills that Spokane does along with fire and, and the, the facilities that we provide and to be ready for a situation should something come up. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you do those? Boy, with Ebola scare, <laughs> we had them pretty regularly. Yeah, that was probably the most recent with the influenza season that we had. We had some drilling there. Mm -hmm. uh, but disaster preparedness courses are, are pretty routine through emergency departments. Work closely with the EMS community, uh, organizing those drills as well. Um, because you're kind of it. You have someone that comes in and they've been exposed to a chemical or they have an infectious exposure. You're, that's where they're going through is the emergency department mm -hmm. generally. And trying to make sure you identify those people so they don't walk through a waiting room that's filled with folks. Yeah, and, uh, boy, it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. You have to be ready for just about mm -hmm. anything. Special mm -hmm. rooms and decontamination rooms and a special way to triage. And yeah, we do that quite regularly. Okay, let's take another phone call. We have Dan. Good evening, Dan. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Well, thank you for waiting. I have a question about the consistent care program and how the emergency rooms in this, in the state of Washington, uh, just about all of them are are going to the consistent care program, how they get away with a, a lifetime of profiling the sick and the disabled, a lifetime sentence that can never be removed, and it discriminates against the disabled that have chronic conditions that need an emergency room quite often. And I just want to know um, what your feelings are that, about that tonight and how I go about getting myself off this consistent care program because I can't use an ER in the state of Washington because of it. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your call. I'm not familiar with the program. Yeah, I'm, the, I can, I can, I'm very familiar with it. So the consistent care program, when we look at the amount of money we have to deliver health care across the country, it's not getting any bigger and we have more patients expanding. So 
What we've done is we have identified people who are frequent utilizers of emergency services. And when we identify those people, we go through their visits, do a case review with two physicians, usually the primary care physician of that patient, and we see if they're appropriate uses of the emergency department. The average ER bill across the country, regardless of your complaints, $1,200. Mm -hmm. So every time someone steps foot in the emergency department, $1,200 bill is engendered. And it's not designed to keep people out of the emergency department. We see all those people in the consistent care program do a medical screening exam. And if they have an issue that we feel requires emergent care, we deliver very good care. But what the consistent care program has done is it's created a resource for patients that are identified as high utilizers to get care through their primary care physicians. And a lot of it was done to crack down on narcotic prescriptions across the street. Spokane County has one of the highest death rates secondary to overdose from prescription narcotics anywhere in the country. And so what we found is people were going to ERs to obtain these prescriptions, selling them on the street. And this, this program started, Darren Nevin, who's one of our partners working uh, with some people in Olympia, got this program up and running. And it's really spread throughout the state. But we've identified some people that were using emergency departments 60 times a year. So do the math 60 times a year at 1200 bucks for just the minimal cost. It wasn't fair to the system. And so when we get the consistent care patients enrolled, we try and have access plans for them. And for the gentleman's question, I, I really feel terrible. He feels like he was discriminated against. But we want, it, want you to have access to the care that you need that's one cost effective, two very high quality care. And uh, if you do have an emergent complaint, come to the ER. It doesn't mean you can't use the emergency department. But if we examine you and feel it doesn't require emergent care, we will say, well, we're going to have you. I'm going to call your primary care physician. I'm going to get you seen tomorrow at 8 in the morning. We have social workers that help out with these folks. And that's, that's again, a drift of medicine in general in that we have so many different issues that we deal with in our community that funnel into the emergency department because it's the only place open at 3 a.m. So we've been creating alliances with community detox centers to take care of our intoxicated patients, mental health care facilities, so we have places to expedite people that need mental health care. And that's the game of medicine, unfortunately, and the way it's going in, in this gentleman's issue is that we're really trying to be creative in how do we provide high quality care that's more on par with what the rest of the world is spending. Um, can he get off the list once yes. he's been put on mm -hmm. it? You can. You, do you ask to be taken off a list? How does that, what's the procedure? It takes almost, I would say, almost as much time and effort and communication with the primary care provider, the patient, and the program to be taken off the list as it does to be put on the list in the first place. It's a very extensive process. Um, it involves case management. Uh, we have case managers at our hospital, um, as well as I'm sure Providence, that work on that with us, with all the patients that are on this program. Um, because it is so extensive, because it's taken very seriously, it's, it's something that's not taken lightly. It's not something that someone just comes in five times and then it gets turned on. It doesn't happen that easily. So it, it can, you can get off the list. It just takes work. It takes a little effort. But. Well, and the state tracks visits. So they, mm -hmm. there's a, the ED, the emergency uh, department information exchange, will track visits throughout the state. So when I have a patient that shows up, I get a fax from ED that says this patient has been seen in nine different ERs across the state in the last three months. And what we're linking right now to these ED faxes are access to the Washington State Prescription Monitoring Program. So we'll know that if a patient's been prescribed narcotics in Olympia or Kennewick. And so the consistent care program, I, I, it shouldn't have a derogatory connotation. It's actually a very good resource for patients that require higher level or more frequent visits of care. Um, I, I don't know if there's truly a way to get out of that because it's not designed to discriminate. All it is is to create an extra level of network for that patient to get care expedited. You know, if they don't need it at 2 a.m., then we're going to get it for them later that day. And I think um, one of the things, you know, we talked so much today about um, the right care at the right location, and this is just before that. So this is the right care in primary care. And so if you have pulmonary disease or heart disease or um, diabetes, you know, the, the ER or the urgent care, you know, their purpose is for those life-threatening diseases or life-threatening issues. And um, we want the, your chronic illness, um, your asthma, um, pulmonary issues, heart failure, we want those to be done in your primary care for your doc and your team to know what your medicines are. What did we do last? It didn't work, so let's try this. If we, if we ER shop, then we don't have that history. And so the best thing for the patient is to have that primary care provider. And um, across the country, they have the patient-centered medical home. And the idea is that you have a medical home, and then you go to the right care at the right time for the right thing. 
And so I think that's a little bit of what we're talking and that's what the, that program does is it says the right place for the right care at the right time. Very well said. Uh, let's take another phone call. Don from Calgary. Good evening, Don. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. I just have a general question for your panel. I wondered what they thought of the concept of patients of a certain age group carrying two baby aspirin in their pocket and if they have chest pain to take it, um, it might save their life. All right, thank you, Don. Absolutely, so uh, one of the things that we do here in Spokane is our uh, 911 dispatchers are trained to give some over the, over the phone instructions and that is one of the things that is being done is the possibility of asking the right questions when the caller and reports that so-and-so is having chest pain or uh, whatever their complaint might be. And so what they do is they then ask a series of questions. Um, and then if they do have that aspirin available in their home, giving them the aspirin, uh, they teach uh, CPR guidelines over the phone. Um, there's ways of, you know, is there epinephrine in the house? Do, you, do they have known allergies? And so our dispatchers are addressing that to hopefully provide some better care again before it takes us um, time to get there. And so um, I know one of the things the American Heart Association is pushing is for uh, the use of aspirin when it comes to cardiac. You always see the commercials and the Bayer uh, infomercials about utilizing that. And so I think it's a really, really good tool as long as there's definitely some um, instances where you wouldn't want to give that aspirin. But for the most part, I think that um, if it's deemed under those circumstances, that's absolutely a good idea. That's so fascinating. What other types of maybe basic first aid do you advise people to know about, say, and we're, we are coming up on those summer months, and we talked a little bit about, about this before the, the show started tonight, but for instance, how do I know if my child has a, a fracture? And, you know, some of those things, bee stings are going to become prominent, tick bites, those sort of things. What can we arm ourselves with before we even make the phone call or while we're making the phone call and before emergency teams get there? Um, I think the best thing is most of those first aid kits that you would get at Walmart, you know, it's one of those, you kind of get what you pay for. So if it's a five or six dollar first aid kit, it's probably going to have some band-aids and some gauze. But the more, the more you spend on a first aid kit, you might get um, some different splints or a, a, a bee sting kit or something along those lines. One of the big things we push for um, is just the education side. Um, INHS teaches first aid and CPR uh, classes that combines the two classes and teaches very, very basic um, first aid maneuvers, whether it's using a, a magazine to splint a possible broken arm or leg. Uh, we talk about tourniquet use, which is really big in emergency medicine right now um, when it comes to stopping bleeding, especially if you're out in the rural area and uh, you know a chainsaw incident or some sort of laceration that causes life-threatening bleeding. One of the things that we're teaching is that use of tourniquets. Um, you know, first aid kits that have uh, bee sting kits and things along those lines are good. Um, you know, the only downfall of it's a known allergy and you don't have that epinephrine pen, there's not, you're not going to find an EpiPen inside one of those first aid kits. It needs to be prescribed by a doctor or given to you from a, a, a facility. Um, but I think the education side is the biggest piece of just getting out there and um, they're usually pretty low cost programs that, you know, we, we teach it in the area. They can come to us. Um, and help with that thinking outside the box when it comes to treating some uh, pretty serious injuries. Mm -hmm. Do you advise at all going to the internet for any of that? Are there any websites that can help or would you rather see them take one of the classes? Um, I, I definitely would always recommend uh, a credible source. Um, the internet is obviously filled with credible sources and non-credible sources. Um, you know, one thing we see in the ambulance is someone looks up their symptoms on some sort of web-based diagnostic <laughs> tool and it's <laughs> you know, it's either cancer or runny nose, and so it kind of ranges between severity. Um, so definitely, um, you know, American Heart Association is always a good tool. They do first aid things along those lines. Um, but I think a, a education from a, a credible source, I think, could definitely be recommended. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, let's take another phone call. Diane, good evening. Hello. Hello, do you have a question for our panel? Yes, I do, and thank you all so much for um, spending the time with us. Um, I was wondering, Historically, emergency rooms have been used for the homeless people as their first base of care and the underemployed where they don't have any insurance and this is the first place they come to is the emergency room. Um, is that seeing any kind of lessening effect now that we have uh, the ACA and, and more people hopefully being insured? Uh, how is that going as far as the emergency rooms? 
Hmm. That's an interesting point. I would say yes. I think we're starting to see some improvements with regards to people having coverage. Mm -hmm. um, we also have more programs within our hospital to get people enrolled mm -hmm. in coverage, and I'm sure Providence does, and so does Rockwood. Mm -hmm. um, it really helps the patient get onto a program, and I think we have seen an increase in covered folks that come in through the door, but also those that aren't, they're getting access to care and access to coverage for the care that they've been given. So I think there has been a, a positive. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an uphill busy, battle. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, I mean, the, the, the Apple Care has been great, and we have an expanded insured patient population. But the problem that we have is there's a large lack of primary care providers in the area, and that's, I think, one of the big pushes to have these medical schools open in Spokane and heavily recruit primary care providers to Spokane is that, as she alluded to, if you have, if you're underinsured or uninsured, the emergency department's really your only option, and it's, like we alluded to, an expensive option. So just like Rockwood's doing, Providence has been very aggressive at trying to find expanded ways to keep people uh, in our community um, in the right direction for primary care. and. Um, hopefully it gets better as we get more primary care physicians in the area. The last statistic I read, there's a, there's a shortage of like 35,000 primary care physicians across the United States. And if you look at how long it takes to make a primary care doctor, it's going to be a while to fill that. Well, I think that's why nurse practitioners and, and uh, physician's assistants are a wonderful resource and that you can extend that physician provider or have a nurse practitioner running their own clinic and providing very good primary care initially and filling that gap. We have another phone call coming in from Ron here in Spokane. Good evening, Ron. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to call in and say that uh, Dr. Getz would not remember me, but I remember him. <laughs> um, I, I was operated on in uh, Phoenix in early February, and uh, I got home here, and it, what had happened was they had to uh, drill a hole in my skull. It's about the size of a 50-cent piece. I remember you. And... Uh, <laughs> It uh, got quite infected. Oh boy! And, uh, I so, just wanted, it. It was really uh, uh, quite a problem. I found out later it was um, spinal fluid coming out of the hole. And um, you got me in, and uh, uh, Dr. Carlson did a great job. Had to take all the hardware out of my head, but uh, I'm doing great. That's wonderful to hear. Ron, thank you so much for your call. That's very nice of you to call in, and I'm sure that touched Dr. Getz tonight also. Yes. Thank you, and we're glad that you're doing better. Yeah. Say hi to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> you probably get that quite often. Yeah, it's a, that's, that's why we do this. It's, yeah. it's phenomenally rewarding. I get cookies baked, you know, dropped off, and I do eat them. <laughs> no, that's a good idea, trying to figure out who did it, and lots of thank you cards, and that's the rewarding part is when people come up to you and say, hey, you did make a big difference. And I think people historically think emergency physicians sometimes don't do anything. But you know, we, for the small people that we see that really need us, we do a lot. And I think that's one of the reasons everybody in this room does it. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a very special breed. It, it takes a different sort of doctor to do what you do and to see the patients that, uh, that all of you see on a daily base, basis. Um, you know, why did you choose emergency medicine? Well, I think it was a mix of I love the pace of it and I like that sense of never knowing what comes through the door. Um, I think that's, it's, we tend to be a little bit uh, frenetic in our pace when we approach things and it was something that I come in for a nine or ten hour shift and I blink and it's over. You know, I might have had a cup of coffee, no lunch, and used the bathroom once, but uh, I, it's, it's just wonderful. And it's kind of funny, we use scribes in our emergency department now who actually do all of the note taking. I don't have to carry a pen any longer because I have a scribe that types and these are very gifted college students that almost all invariably go to medical school and their first emergency shift that they work, it's their feet hurt and their back hurts and they need to use the restroom and they're hungry. Um, but when they see what comes through the door and how exciting it is, they, I want to be an emergency doctor someday, you know, that's what they say. And, and I've been doing it almost 10 years post-residency and every day I go to work I enjoy doing it. I, I bet the same can be said for all of you. Absolutely. I think emergency medicine kind of chose me in a sense. When I ended up rotating through the department, um, it just, something spoke to me. And I said, this is what I want to spend my time doing. It's never a dull moment, and it's just it's so gratifying at the end of the day. You just feel like you've done a really good job for your community. And, like, you know, people calling in, you know, letting you know, or seeing that person in the grocery store who wasn't able to walk two months earlier who's now up and walking mm -hmm. around buying their apples. So. Yeah. Or maybe recognizes you, but you don't recognize, you know, it, or because you see a lot. Yeah. yeah, you see a lot of it. Yeah, you might recognize them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of rewards that come with it. Yeah, even for me, I do um, mostly administration, but I stay 
um, clinical as a nurse practitioner in the urgent cares because you can't you can't step away from that patient all the time. You still need that patient focus and that patient care, and it keeps you kind of centered and grounded. So mm -hmm. absolutely. And Sean, what do you say to those um, maybe uh, teenagers that are considering EMS uh, becoming an EMT? You know. What do you tell them about your passion for this um, side of medicine? Uh, my definite side is is the people. Uh, I love interacting with people. Um, it's never like Dr. Getz said. It's never the same two days in a row. Uh, you can you can see the same patient two days in a row, and something will be different. Um, it is by far, I probably speak, um, the most rewarding job that I've ever had. Um, it definitely does something to you. There's you know there's definitely the losses that affect you in a certain way, but um, we see a lot, kind of like Dr. Getz was saying, where. Uh, we transport a patient and we don't get a lot of after news about them. We drop them off at a hospital. We kind of pass the care off to them, but we don't hear how they do. Um, and it is an, a pretty amazing feeling to have them stop back by. We have a dorm where we stay and they stop back by and bring cookies and donuts <laughs> and cakes and pies and all kinds of things and thank you cards. We have a wall up uh, in Deer Park with just all the thank you cards. And um, that is by far the most rewarding that beats um, anything about this job. And, and so that's that's my drive towards it. And I think that's what we try to pass on to other people is, um, you know, all of our students that go through our programs is just, um, it's a lot of work and there'll be days where, you know, you've been woken up, I don't know how many times where you're trying to sleep or have dinner or whatever, but it always ends up paying off, you know, at the end of it. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing too, um, we're down to just a few minutes left in the show, um, but I'm hearing a lot of, with the apps that you talked about, mm -hmm. Sean, and the technology that's coming into place with people being able to send pictures and photos in it and do that through the computer. What's on the horizon for emergency medicine? What are we looking at? Because it's ever changing, always uh, something different. Uh, what are we gonna see in the near future when it comes to emergency medicine? Well, I think you touched on it earlier a little bit with telemedicine. That's been kind of the talk um, as of late um, with regards to kind of the next level of patient care um, without having to actually leave your home mm -hmm. um, for some of those things that can be managed that way. Yeah, I think that's definitely on the horizon. I think Very consolidated good. care networks is going to be the biggest thing. I think the, the days of your primary care doctor having a shop on the corner is probably not not long for this world because we're really looking at for ways to deliver very efficient centralized care to make it convenient for patients and avoid maybe excess visits that, that weren't even required and I, I providence has been very aggressive with that and trying to find ways to deliver consolidated care to cut down on over treatment or or over utilization of resources that aren't needed and i think that's why we've moved towards electronic medical records and that i can pull up the medical record of a Providence patient who was seen by their primary care doctor two days ago, look at all the tests that were ordered. And when I'm seeing them, you know, I'm not flying blind. I'm not ordering a $1,200 test that the patient didn't realize was ordered two days ago. Mm -hmm. So I think consolidated care is kind of the future. Well, it's certainly interesting. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom and knowledge with us this evening. Um, that will do it for Health Matters. Thank everyone who called in with a question. We hope you'll join us on May 21st when our topic will be rural medicine. Until then, thanks so much for watching. I'm Teresa Lukens. Good night. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSBS, and by the following. I really liked the idea of being part of Providence, where if I have a question, if there's something that I'm concerned about, I can always call a specialist. I'm Dr. Anna Barber, and I chose Providence because here I can help children thrive and reach their highest potential. If you read Providence's mission statement, it's all about delivering quality care to the patient at all times. I'm Dr. Peter Rinaldi, and I chose Providence because they put the doctor-patient relationship first. Find your doctor online at phc.org.